So, um, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for coming and welcome to my lecture performance uh, titled Jewishness and Heine's Othering in Richard Strauss's Schlechtes Wetter. Um, so I would like to begin devoid of context with a reading of Heine's poem in question, first in the original German and then in my own translation. Das ist ein schlechtes Wetter. Es regnet und stürmt und schneit. Ich sitze am Fenster und schaue hinaus in die Dunkelheit. Da schimmert ein einsames Lichtchen, das wandert langsam fort. Ein Mütterchen mit dem Lanternchen wankt über die Straße dort. Ich glaube, Mehl und Eier und Butter kaufte sie ein. Sie will einer Kuchen backen fürs große Töchterlein. Die liegt zu Hause im Lehnstuhl und blinzelt schläfrig ins Licht. Die goldenen Locken wallen über das süße Gesicht. It's terrible weather. It's raining and storming and snowing. I sit at the window and gaze out into the darkness. There, a solitary light is shimmering and it moves slowly onward. A little old mother with a lantern totters across the street there. I believe flour and eggs and butter she has bought. She plans to bake a cake for her fat little daughter. She is lying at home in an armchair and she blinks sleepily in the light, her golden curls flowing over her sweet face. I ask everyone to place this poem in the back of your mind and to think on it until we will return to it in a bit. What I'm sure we can all agree upon initially is that this poem is as evocative as it is odd. It is, however, a poem that can gain great meaning and perhaps tragedy once put into the context of the complex relationship that Heinrich Heine had with his own identity in the face of what was essentially German nationalism. So first, who was Heinrich Heine? Um, I'll share my screen so you can see this nice looking man. Heine was born in 1797 in Dusseldorf to a Jewish family. As a child, he was always called Harry, but began to go by Heinrich once he converted to Lutheranism in 1825, a very critical point to which we will return. Being born in this region was back then a complexity, given that the Napoleonic Wars had put the city under French occupation at the time of his birth. It wasn't until Napoleon's defeat in 1815 that it became part of Prussia, now part of Germany. Whatever Napoleon's more negative and bellicose traits, Heine as a young man worshipped what he perceived to be Napoleon's promotion of, quote, revolutionary ideals of liberty and equality. But perhaps Heine had also worshipped Napoleon's more negative and bellicose traits. After all, the Nietzschean resentment that must have plagued Heine, a man of great aspiration whose genius was consistently ignored due to his status as a Jew, must have bred a certain type of aggression in the young man, an aggression that manifested both in the biting and sardonic nature of his poetry, as well as his occasional propensity for actual violence. He had initially attended university in Bonn to study law, but it was here that he was first introduced to romantic poetry through a lecture by Schlegel. After only a year, he left to continue studying law at the University of Göttingen in 1820. George Prochnik in his book, Heinrich Heine, Writing the Revolution, describes his time in Göttingen. Quote, from Heine's viewpoint, this was the worst of all possible scenarios a hive of boorish fraternities that could be easily pacified with respect to aspirations for civil liberties, but were quick to embrace the lowest prejudices associated with the nationalistic movement. Göttingen's narrow-minded quiescence reflected the high proportion of students from noble families in residence, and their displays of tribalism clinched Heine's loathing for the place. In Heine's own words, 
The delusions they entertained were identical to those nurtured by their fathers. They were the flowers of the earth. Everyone else was grass. And just like their progenitors, the current crop of students sought to cover over their own worthlessness by exalting their ancestors without bothering to inquire whether those characters might actually be marred by some fatal blemish, such as chronic disregard for true virtue, together with a habit of bestowing endless titles on panderers. One scene stood out above all other from Heine's time in Göttingen. On a broiling summer day, Heine came upon an impoverished athlete who, having worn himself out running a strenuous training course, was spotted by several young bloods of Hanover, pedigreed students of ethnography. They offered him a few coins if he'd run back over the entire distance he'd just traveled. The man desperately needed the money, and notwithstanding his exhaustion, he ran. Heine saw him struggling not to fall, while right behind him, the well-fed noble youths galloped on their high horses. Every so often, the hoofs of these steeds cracked the desperate runner's back as he gasped for breath. The outrageous indifference of the aristocrats to a human life they deemed inferior to their own is given extra shading by Heine's note about their field of study, ethnography. Cannot go unremarked that the most famous professor at Göttingen at the time was Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, the ethnographer who developed a comprehensive taxonomy of the races and was the first to popularize the term Caucasian for light-skinned European people, a classification incorporating his assessment that the people of the Caucasus were the most beautiful people on earth. Anti-Semitism was not born in Germany during the Third Reich. Hitler merely drew upon the centuries of scapegoating and stereotyping the Jewish people for his own purposes. The Jews were killed en masse during the Black Death in Germany because it was believed they were spreading the illness. Martin Luther himself turned against them in his writings once they refused to convert to his religion. Heine had a complex relationship with his own Jewishness. He once called Jewishness his, quote, unlucky genealogical communication. Elsewhere, he characterized it as a cosmic taint, exclaiming upon the indestructibility of, quote, that mummy of a people which roams the earth, a petrified piece of world history, a ghost that makes its living by peddling bills of exchange and cast off trousers. While Heine unsurprisingly certainly had an elevated way with words, his attitude towards his own identity is easy to understand. Of course he felt that Jewishness was a burden, given that the environment in which he tried desperately to flourish was consistently hostile to him, regardless of his own virtues and intellect. At Göttingen, he was even expelled from a student fraternity due to the fact that he was Jewish. He was so enraged by this that he challenged one of the students in that fraternity to a duel with pistols. The duel was stopped before it could begin, but Heine was suspended from the university. It's worth noting that this was the first of 10 incidents in his life where Heine, in an act of rage and pride, challenged someone to a duel with pistols. Heine was a man emboldened with a desperation and frustration unmatched by many. But who could blame him? He, by all accounts, was an excellent student, a great looking guy, politically minded, and would go on to being one of the greatest poets of all time. Yet. None of this mattered in the eyes of the German people who could not see past his status as a Jew. It must have been soul-crushing to hold the poetry, art, and culture of a people in such high regard and to yourself match this level of genius, yet have the very culture whose beauty you love so much reject you before they even give you a chance. Ernst Pavel, in his book The Poet Dying, Heinrich Heine's Last Years in Paris, describes Heine's temperament. Quote, Heine's genius for making enemies, intimately linked though it may have been to his poetic inspiration, proved a more problematic gift throughout much of his life. He regularly tended, moreover, to let himself be carried away by an exuberant sense of either justice or irony, or both, to the point of lashing out wildly and wittily without much regard as to choice of targets. Heine's frustration and anger coupled with a desire for acceptance by the culture that had rejected him culminated in 1825 with his conversion to Lutheranism, 
In his own words, Heine believed that a baptismal certificate was his ticket to admission to European culture. The Prussian government had been gradually restoring discrimination against the Jewish people, and in 1822, it introduced a law excluding Jews from academic posts. As Powell described, the reluctant baptism of Harry Heine, born again as Christian Johann Heinrich Heine, was a farce and treated by him from the very beginning as a meaningless concession to practical necessity. In the wake of post-Napoleonic reaction, most positions in Prussia were closed to unbaptized Jews. The tragedy of the situation is, unsurprisingly, his conversion did not end up benefiting him in any way. German Christians saw him as an imposter in the same way they viewed all Jews attempting to, in their minds, appropriate German culture, and German Jews saw him as a traitor to their own people. Heine, despite his self-deprecating writings about his own Jewishness, still was enamored with history, and in particular Jewish history. Around the time of his conversion, he was attempting to write a novel about a rabbi, one that was never finished. For as much as he wanted acceptance, he was unwilling to part entirely with his identity. Pavel sums it up well, quote, Assimilation, then, was indeed possible, but only for those willing to fully surrender their identity and adopt the dominant culture. Even the most philo-Semitic German liberals, and there were some, expected a Jew to stop being and acting like one as the price of admission to civilized society. It was a price Heine himself was both unable and unwilling to pay. Heine's frustration at the imbalance of his relationship with Germany was a tragedy. He worshipped Goethe as the god of the German language. However, Proshnik writes about their one and only interaction, which he says, quote, clearly Goethe found nothing in Heine worth encouraging. This all leads us to 1827, with the publication of his second book of poems, the Buch der Lieder. Das ist ein schlechtes Wetter comes from this book, from the subsection ironically titled Homecoming. This is an incredibly loaded title, given what we know about Heine's own relationship with his home that had spent the entirety of his life rejecting him. Let's now return to the poem in a greater context. I would like to view this poem through the lens of Heine's frustration towards German society as uplifting its own people at the expense of people like him. So I'm going to share my screen and I hope that you all can see the poem in my English translation. So if we begin, it is terrible weather. It's raining and snowing, storming and snowing. I sit at the window and gaze out into the darkness. So immediately Heine is establishing a dichotomy, a boundary, right? There is the image of he is inside in the darkness and there is a window separating him from what is described as a very violent and hostile environment. The next thing he notices, a solitary light shimmering, he finds that it is a little old mother, right? A Mütterchen with a lantern tottering across the street. And Heine's choice of verb here is very notable, wankt, which is best translated as tottering. It implies that this little old mother is not physically very strong, right? She's, she's tottering, she is frail. This stands in a clear opposition to this violent storm, this violent environment described outside that despite this violence uh, and this weather being too much for him, the young Heine, to go outside, it clearly poses no physical threat to this weak old woman who not only went out in the storm, but she went out in the storm to buy groceries. This is where the poem uh, shifts focus, both in terms of the rhyme scheme, uh, Heine goes from uh, ABAB rhyme scheme into a sort of completely freeform rhyme here as the focus shifts from his own literal point of view into something where the camera sort of enters into seeing things he shouldn't really be able to see. So I believe flour and eggs and butter she has bought. She plans to bake a cake for her fat little daughter. So the word Grosse in German does not inherently imply uh, a weight designation. It can just mean large, grown up. I have seen some translations of the poem that just describe it as her big little daughter. Um, however, in speaking to a multitude of Germans, especially German singers, 
they've all agreed that in this context, it's very difficult to see Grosse here describing anything other than her weight, especially in the context of her uh, eating cake. And here's where we get uh, this layer of commentary, right? So we have this little old mother who is somehow unaffected by this violent storm going out of her way to bake a cake for her fat daughter. This uh, conjures up the idea, right, that this daughter is somehow spoiled by the mother. This is clearly not the first cake that has been baked for her. And then the poem goes on to describe the daughter. She is lying at home in an armchair and she blinks sleepily into the light. Here we have another dichotomy of light, that Heine sits in the darkness, but this fat daughter uh, is having a very relaxed time, unaware of the storm, blinking sleepily into the light her golden curls flowing over her sweet face. Golden curls here is a very um, important physical description. Um, as you now know, Heine's education was in the seat of ethnography, which is this you know, slightly pseudoscientific um, position that the Germans held back then, right? That your physical traits determined anything. And uh, Heine's awareness of what the Caucasian, later Aryan people would determine as the ideal physical traits was very much in his mind at this time. So it is not, it has to be noted that this fat girl getting the cake is blonde. She is a stand-in for this young generation of German people. To me, this poem is impossible, especially given the context that it's written in, to not see it in this type of um, very highly charged political um, lens. To summarize, the poem is a direct metaphor for Heine's feelings at the time. Trapped in the darkness, unable to go into the hostile environment outside, the same environment that poses no threat to the Aryan people who spend their energy and resources fattening themselves at the expense of people like him. With all that in mind, um, let's now jump forward almost a hundred years to Richard Strauss's musical setting of this poem. Um, for this, uh, I would like to introduce soprano Catherine Henry, who has so graciously um, agreed to sing this song. Let's see, original sound on. Das ist ein schlechtes Wetter, es regnet und schirrt und schnarrt. 
like to bring up um, a musical score of the song. Uh, if I can share my screen again. And now, let's see. Hopefully everyone can see this, the score for Strauss's Schlechtes Wetter. So I'd like to just do a sort of brief um, discussion of how Strauss composed this song because it is quite tied into um, a lot of extra musical meaning within uh, his composition. So as you can see, I've marked in color. Um, as we all know, Strauss is a composer who loves composing motivically and with a sense, a great sense of architecture. So as you might have heard, the song exists in three very distinct parts, right? We first have, as in the poem, this violent representation of a storm. Uh, and then, as Heine is sort of searching through the darkness to see something, we have this interesting uh, transitional music that's very sort of in the bass of the piano. And then it ends with what is a full-blown uh, Viennese waltz. So the interesting thing with Strauss's composition here, as you can see marked in color, is that the entire song is all built around three musical ideas that he evolves and uses in different permutations to describe different things. So the first, marked in this sort of uh, nice magenta, is what I call the rain motif. The second, marked in green, which we see fully formed on the second page here, is what I call the blinking motif. You could also call it the light motif, the lantern motif. I like blinking because to me there's something about that kind of suggests a <laughs> an actual blinking. Uh, and then the third is the waltz theme, which you see here in blue first in a minor key. we then hear later. And these three motifs um, make up the entirety of the song. So as you can see in the beginning, Strauss uses the rain and um, a sort of hint of the blinking motif to create this vista of a stormy situation. We then get the fully formed blinking motif, which, as you may have noticed, is the second and third beats of a waltz pattern, right? Mm, chuck, chuck, mm, chuck, chuck, mm, chuck, chuck, here. The introduction of the waltz theme. And then, as the focus changes to him finally noticing this little light glimmering in the distance, this motif moves all the way up to the top of the piano. And I don't know a better way of describing a solitary light flickering than that. Um, as he begins to notice the mother, we start to get more sort of development of the music. And then the real fascinating moment comes when the focus shifts into the cake and the fat little daughter. And you can see here where the waltz theme comes in again that we have all three motifs working together, right? We have the waltz theme in the right hand. And the um, actual bass line then for the Viennese waltz is a combination of the rain motif and then the blinking. So we see that he basically uses the three motifs initially to establish this sense of this dark, hostile environment, but then he recontextualizes all of them in the second half of the song to be this almost like parody of a bombastic Viennese waltz. As it goes on, the waltz gets more and more intense. You can see here on page 22, the blinking motif, as it describes her blinking sleepily into the light in a full focus. <laughs> And then the sort of odd exaltation that follows of the golden curls, right? It's the singer's biggest high note. 
um, everything sort of moves up to describing this, this sort of bizarrely, um, you know, unimportant image for the sort of casual listener. But as we just talked about, it is quite the important image. Now, Strauss was certainly very aware of all the extra musical meanings of this song, um, which we're about to get into a bit more detail in. Um, one thing to notice right off the bat with um, his musical setting here are um, both his inclusion of the Viennese waltz and second, his um, key, the way that he's represented to key areas, right? That the piece is in F major, yet it begins in F minor. Begins in F minor where the alien foreign notes, right? D flat, A flat, B natural, E natural, are actually the notes that you might find in the uh, Mishaberic scale, which at the time was most commonly associated with Jewish and klezmer music. So it's as if Strauss is already off the bat showing um, through in a kind of twisted musical way that the Jewish elements of the music, just as it exists in the poem of Heine himself sitting alone in the darkness, are somehow a sort of foreign um, force in the overall tableau of F major. Um, I think the screen share turned off. Yes. So from an analytic standpoint, this song is um, a masterwork of motivic architecture and transformation. Um, it's also equally impressive and important as an act of poetic interpretation. The soprano Barbara Hannigan once told me that the act of setting a song by itself is poetic interpretation. And I would argue that Strauss's musical choices when setting this poem are a concrete justification for my own analysis of Heine. What is more iconic to European, specifically German and Austrian culture than a waltz? Specifically the high culture of Viennese waltzes heard in balls and operetta. Schlechtes Wetter in Strauss's setting spends most of its runtime sounding as a bombastic Viennese waltz, despite the text being about rain, baking a cake, and a fat blonde girl. Strauss was nothing if not a composer without specific and targeted intentions, and I refuse to believe that Strauss's musical language in this piece is not a direct commentary on his understanding of the undertones of Heine's poem. In a way, the transformation of the rain motif from one of violence, darkness, and hostility to that of elegance and playfulness in a waltz is a commentary in itself. The piece opens in a minor key using the same focus on a clangorous minor second that Strauss had used quite recently to portray the Jews in Zalame. It's only when the focus of the poem shifts away from Heine sitting in the darkness to the mother and her fat daughter in the light eating cake and relaxing that the music shifts into a major key, bringing in a full waltz, but more importantly, using the exact same musical motifs used in the dark Jewish opening. Strauss is musically painting his awareness of this dichotomy. The same environment that is hostile to the Jews is a fun and relaxing time for everyone else. The rain motif that is so violent and aggressive as to prevent Heine from going outside in the beginning becomes nothing more than a playful waltz accompaniment for the wa mother and daughter in the second part of the song. Strauss did not set many of Heine's poems during his life, but set him more than any of his musical contemporaries. Laura Tunbridge in her essay, Versioning Strauss, writes, Heine was not one of Strauss's favored poets for musical treatment. The relatively scant representation of Heine and Strauss's output was in keeping with German attitudes to the poet at the time. Heine remained popular, new editions were published regularly, and he was respected by many literary figures, although the iconoclasm of his poetics presented a major problem for the modern aesthetic. For Karl Kraus, the foremost Heine literary antagonist, Heine was associated with, quote, a failure of authenticity. For Krauss, Heine had corrupted the German language through his emphasis on style over content. Um, the Jewish Heine was also depicted by Krauss as being all too eager to assimilate and gain access to capitalist society. The anti-Semitic strains of these arguments are clear, and together with the protests against proposed memorials to the poet at the end of the 19th century, they forewarn of Heine's vilification by the Third Reich. Uh, 
They also resonate in a Straussian context, for the reception of the composer's works has circled around similar themes of ornament and historical reflexivity at the expense of what some consider authentic modernity. Krauss, for one, had defended Oscar Wilde's Salome, but in later years was derisive about Strauss's collaborations with Hofmannsthal, using terms of mercantilism similar to those in his own critiques of Heine. Strauss's relationship to anti-Semitism and Judaism in general are difficult to pin down. It's worth noting that Schlechtes Wetter was composed in 1918, before the rise of the Third Reich, when most of Strauss's documented major life events regarding his interactions with Jewish people occurred. Strauss, by all accounts, was a massive opportunist and fan of himself and his own talents. He frequently collaborated artistically with Jewish people and was often surrounded by Jewish artists and was even related to several Jewish people through marriage. Despite this, he still frequently engaged in lots of the same anti-Semitic discourse as was entirely too common back then. Zalame, written a decade earlier, is perhaps the most explicit example of his writing Jewishness in music. Through the ensemble of the Jews, who, as stated by another character, do nothing but argue about their religion, the Jews are musically characterized, as I said before, by a clangorous and cacophonous motif that pits D minor and E flat minor together, showcasing the minor second as a dissonous representative of the clatter displayed by their constant arguing. This. Strauss's engagement in Jewish tropes and stereotypes reached an ugly head in 1935 when, in a letter to his Jewish librettist, Stefan Zweig, he expressed his frustration, disbelief, and disgust over Zweig's apparent refusal to continue their working relationship. In the letter, Strauss admonishes Zweig for his Jewish obstinacy, his pride of race, and feeling of solidarity. The composer concludes by instructing Zweig to, quote, be a good boy, forget Moses and the other apostles for a few weeks, and work on your one-act plays. Of course, one cannot forget Strauss's involvement with Reich's Musikkammer during the Nazi regime. Defenders of Strauss will say that his involvement was purely to either protect Jewish composers, artists, and family members from an inside position of power, or two, because Strauss was an opportunist devoid of actual malice towards the Jewish people or feelings of German nationalism. As with many Germans who were spared during denazification, the moral gray area has remained quite gray. I can only go so far in arguing for or against these points because the actual documentation of Strauss's own feelings and actions is ambiguous and sparse. What we do know is that after Hitler's suicide, Strauss wrote, quote, the most terrible period of human history is at an end. The 12 year reign of bestiality, ignorance, and anti culture under the greatest criminals, during which Germany's 2,000 years of cultural evolution met its doom, and irreplaceable monuments of architecture and works of art were destroyed by a criminal soldiery. For me, this only confirms that Strauss was a lover of virtue, intellect, and art, quite similar to Heine. Strauss despised Goebbels, Hitler, and the Nazis for their unwillingness to look past someone's race and see their artistic and intellectual capabilities, much as Heine despised his contemporaries for the same reason. Of course, Strauss and Heine share this view from the two opposite sides of the room. Strauss never felt the frustration of someone whose own work was being shunned. He only felt it on behalf of others and felt it when this ignorance led to the destruction of what he deemed to be great works of art and culture. Strauss clearly valued Jewish people when, like Heine or Zweig, they were kindred artistic and intellectual spirits whose existence could further elevate Strauss's own status and compositions. How Strauss may have reacted to a Jewish man on the street, we may never know. It's difficult to know what Strauss's specific attitudes towards the Jewish people in German nationalism were at the time of Schlechtesvetter's composition. It must be remarked upon that Strauss grew up reading and worshiping the words and music of the great anti-Semite Richard Wagner, who infamously penned the horrific essay, Jewishness in Music. In his essay, Wagner compared Germany's occasional ability to accept Jewish artists, including Heine as one of their own, to that of a body riddled with disease, 
who can no longer recognize an invading force such as an insect or virus from what is supposed to be inside it. Quote, only when a body's inner death is manifest do outside elements win the power of lodgment in it, yet merely to destroy it. Then indeed that body's flesh dissolves into a swarming colony of insect life, but who in looking on that body's self would still hold it for living? The spirit, that is, the life, has fled from out that body, has sped to kindred other bodies, and this is all what makes out life. In genuine life alone can we, too, find again the ghost of art, and not within its worm-befreighted carcass. Wagner then goes on to specifically mention Heine. I said above all, the Jews had brought forth no poet. We must here give a moment's mention, then, to Heinrich Heine, at the time when Goethe and Schiller sang among us, we certainly knew nothing of a poetizing Jew. At the time, however, when our poetry became a lie, when every possible thing might flourish from the wholly unpoetic element of our life, but no true poet, then was it the office of a highly gifted poet Jew to bear with fascinating taunts that lie, the bottomless aridity and Jesuitical hypocrisy of our own versifying, which still would give itself the airs of true poetics. His famous musical collaborators, too, he mercilessly lashed for their pretense to pass as artists. No make-believe could hold its ground before him. By the remorseless demon of denial, of all that seemed worth denying was he driven on without a rest, though all the mirage of our mar mar modern self-deception, till he reached the point where in turn he duped himself into a poet and was rewarded by his versified lies being set to music by our own composers. He was the conscience of Judaism, just as Judaism is the evil conscience of our modern civilization. Yeah, Wagner's great, right? Given that Strauss is known to have read most, if not all, of Wagner's writings, one can say with absolute certainty he was familiar with this text. The question then remains, what was Strauss's intention with the setting of Heine's poem? It's entirely clear to me, given how intentionally out of place the insertion of the Viennese waltz is in this setting, that Strauss was well aware of Heine's intentions with the poem. The way I see it, there are two possible interpretations. The first, that Strauss is mocking Heine. Strauss was well aware that he was composing music from a place of privilege, never having had to sit in the darkness, as Heine did, building resentments. Heine wrote the poem from the point of view of looking out into the storm, whereas Strauss composed the song from the point of view of the fat blonde girl. Could it be that in setting this highly charged and personal poem as a Viennese waltz, the symbol of the culture and society that refused Heine entry, he is simply twisting the knife into Heine's legacy? I think those more critical of Strauss's opinion of the Jews might agree. I think, though, the second and more complex interpretation of Strauss's intentions is that Strauss composed the song as a demonstration of the ridiculousness of German nationalism's idea that their culture is somehow above everyone else. While Strauss was certainly a member of German high society, it's shown through his music that he was not someone who believed in a blind respect for all of its elements. If Zalame shows anything, it's that Strauss was willing through music to embrace a level of debauchery, decadence, and scandal for the sake of art over the formality of a high culture that had so benefited his own rise to prominence. As stated previously, much of Strauss's frustration with Goebbels and the Reichsmusikama was their inability to see beyond race and appreciate art for what it is. It makes sense that 20 or some years earlier, Strauss felt some of the same vicarious frustration for Heine, a poet who he clearly saw as skilled, given his multiple settings of his poetry. Strauss frequently employed the Viennese waltz as an element in his music, often in ways alien to its traditional usage. In his operas, he is known to use waltz music in cases where it shouldn't belong, and in doing so, he brings awareness to both the extra musical elements in the drama, whether it be character or situation, as well as simultaneously reframing the usual circumstances that a Viennese waltz is expected to occur, such as at the ball, like in Johann Strauss's Die Fledermaus. In Rosenkavalier, the waltz is occasionally used as a completely serious, almost diegetic element to accompany the various elegant and refined situations occurring on stage, 
However, he also uses a grand statement of the same waltz in the culmination of Baron Ox and Octavian's plot in Act Three, where Ox is driven out of what is basically a brothel, um, and his defeat is celebrated by a cavalcade of debauchery. The waltz's placement here is in sharp contrast to its placement in the elegant ball in Act Two, yet Strauss's suggestion that it works equally well in both settings makes an interesting sociological point. I'll play this example for everyone. As you can see, the same waltz used in two very, very different situations. In Electra, a waltz is used by the title character to ecstatically dance herself to death to celebrate the murder of her mother. In another song setting, written around the exact same time as Schlechtes Wetter, the Ophelia leader, Strauss uses um, a waltz set aside Ophelia's suicidal madness as if to draw attention to Ophelia's fractured and delusional mental state. Strauss's use of a waltz in Schlechtes Wetter for me comes off less as a genuine statement of the elegance and beauty of Germanic culture, but more as a parody of its ridiculous uh, self-aggrandizing. Yes, Strauss loved art, and as anyone can see through his reaction to the destruction caused by World War II, he lamented the loss of European culture in any form. But I think it's safe to say that Strauss also didn't hold the beauty of this culture to the same sacred level that someone like Wagner did. Unlike Wagner, Strauss actually seemed to have a genuine sense of humor about things. In a way, I see the ridiculous use of the waltz as a setting for this poem to be Strauss yelling into the void, is this really the elite culture that Heine was excluded from? I think that Strauss saw that great achievements by German artists were just great achievements by artists who happened to be German, whether or not they were Jewish. It is apparent, especially evidenced by his later statements about the Third Reich, that Strauss's valuing individual artistic and intellectual brilliance was in sharp contrast to the commonly held belief that the German Aryan people were privileged in art and culture solely by their birth, not by their contributions to culture. Strauss's frequent lampooning of the Viennese waltz to me suggests that the waltz represents the paragon of fundamentally dumb art that the Germans held in high regard solely because they lay claim to its invention. By drawing attention to how ridiculous the waltz can sound, Strauss is making a statement. Of course, the great irony of all of this, one that Strauss may have not been, even been aware of, is that Johann Strauss, the great icon of Viennese waltz, was himself Jewish, a fact that the Nazi party later did their best to scrub from all of history. I choose to believe the second interpretation of this setting, as I find it a more genuine take on Strauss's character. I don't think, despite Strauss's forays into detrimental Jewish stereotyping, that he would have gone to the length to set several of Heine's poems solely for the intention of mocking him. This is especially true given that if Strauss did read Wagner's essay, he would have noticed that Wagner does go on to attack the composers who set Heine's poetry to song. Strauss breaks with Wagner here on an ideological level. In this way, Strauss's setting of Schlechtes Wetter serves as an interesting portrait of the composer's attitudes towards both German nationalism and the popular contemporary idea the Jewish people would never really be part of their society, and a portrait that sits interestingly in a time period between Zalame and the Third Reich. I would now like to conclude with an encore performance of the song, now with all the context that has been given, followed by uh, whatever time we have left for a question and answer session as we all ponder the ramifications of this fascinating artistic collaboration set over a century apart. Das Wetter, das Regen, und stirbt und schlägt. 
thank you, everyone. That was my lecture performance. Uh, now, if, if anyone has any uh, questions, comments, feel free to unmute. I had a quick question, Chris. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you so much for this. I, I feel like um, I, I have numerous new avenues into this song um, based on the last 45 minutes. So I really appreciate it. Um, what incredible depth you went into with the poem and the poetic reading and the it's fantastic. Um, I, I, I have a question, I guess more about performance practice than anything. Um, I, I often feel with musical settings of Heine that some of his most potent, um, call it nastiness, um, gets somehow mitigated by either the vocal lyricism or the harmonic language, et cetera. Um, and that this almost the, um, the the lashing out of Heine that we're almost taught to anticipate becomes like very slightly ironed through or sanitized. And um, I I found it interesting that like you you know you you have a young Marshallin or a young Arabella there in your apartment with you who just sang for us. <laughs> you know, I mean somebody of like terrific vocal glamour and vocal beauty, et cetera. And you have like what, what I would almost call like a maybe a turn of the century vocal ecstatic mode for lack of a better word um that so many German speaking composers um, use um this was actually the first time I've ever heard like a singer and pianist really commit to like a certain kind of edginess a certain kind of um um bite, so to speak, like even in those high glamorous phrases at the end. And I, I'm assuming that that was just the two of you discussing this and the two of you like really cementing that. But can, can you comment a little bit just on the, the, I mean, for lack of a better word, like vocal glamour, or vocal beauty, the yeah. cult of vocal beauty we associate with uh -huh. Strauss. And well, for me, a lot of this comes down to the entire concept of satire and sarcasm right that oftentimes the the issue with any kind of irony or satire is that how it's intended is not always how it's received right mm -hmm. that you know heine could write the the love poems he wrote that schumann set for dichterliebe and heine wrote them in a way that was supposed to kind of be like this ironic in a way is making fun of a lot of the tropes of german romantic poetry but then Mm -hmm. Schumann sets them so beautifully that you sort of wonder, A, did Schumann sort of see that? But also then what happens then is the audience doesn't hear any of the <laughs> intention. They just hear Heine's poetry as this very beautiful, romantic, you know, love, loss songs. And for me, one of the potential problems with Schlechtesvetter, if you read it the way I do is that if you perform it focusing too much on the inherent beauty of the vocal lines and the elegance of the waltz, people will just see it as a very elegant waltz and they'll see it as beautiful vocal lines. And then the entire irony and sarcasm of it is essentially lost, right? And this is always the issue with any kind of display of irony and sarcasm that you need to either accept that the audience will just miss the point entirely and see what is supposed to be sarcastic as an actual genuine expression of something, or you have to work harder to bring out that element in it. And for me, working in Schlechtes Wetter, especially in the waltz, to sort of bring attention to the more ridiculous qualities it has of these like insane mm. contours up to talking about the golden hair and the sort of, I don't know how much a translator was Zoom, but the sort of thumpiness of the accompaniment with the blinking motif, at the very least then, even if the audience is not aware of such a sort of uh, explicit poetic reading, they're aware that something is off, or that something is not trying to come off as a genuine statement of beauty, but rather that you're trying to be you know, experiencing something. Because, you know, as Brecht said, the problem with beautiful music and beautiful singing is that the audience just focuses on how beautiful the singing and the music was. They don't actually uh, uh -huh. read anything into it. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thanks so much. Yeah. Uh, Chris. Yes. 
I thought your interpretation of, of Strauss's view of the poem was extremely convincing. Um, and uh, that your whole performance and lecture was uh, outstanding. Thank you. I, I have a couple of questions that just go way beyond what you were focused on. Yeah. Uh, just something to wonder about, did Strauss ever comment on the way Schubert and or Schumann dealt with China, as far as you know? As far as I've researched, no, there's no, um... Maybe some of my, <laughs> Margot or JJ, you know this more than I do, but I, as far as I've researched, I can't find any quote by Strauss on previous settings of Heine. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I imagine he had to have heard them and n knew them. Obviously, um, I, I, he obviously had to have heard them. He knew them, uh, he may have read through them. Uh, and I would think that the mere fact that someone like Schumann, mm -hmm. who was no great lover of Jewish people either, uh, chose to set uh, Heine the way he did, yeah. uh, might have impressed Strauss as this is something worthwhile. Yeah. Um, okay. The, the other question, and as I said, these are not focusing on what you were mm -hmm. talking about, but they're just interesting thoughts. Um, Ravel in Laval's, uh, is also dealing with, with the walls. And I wonder if you find any parallels between oh, sure. Ravel's yeah. take and, and Strauss's take. Well, I think it definitely at a core, you know, I, I feel like through Laval's that Ravel definitely with Strauss shares a similar sense of loving the waltz and more generally just loving the the european elegant culture that came with it but like both ravel and strauss you get the sense from how they use the waltz that i think ravel also saw it both as again the, the stand-in for a destruction of european culture in world war one but also as something that is very easy to at the turn of a what's the what's it flip of a dime flip of a, uh, whatever the expression is very easy at the turn of a hat to go from very elegant and refined to ridiculous it does not take much and i think laval's so most of the brilliance of that piece is how quickly the waltz really <laughs> goes into something that's really like a, a parody of how crazy this the, the time dilations and all of the concepts of it are um, and I imagine if Ravel and Strauss ever had a, got to have a conversation about their yeah. <laughs> ideas of the waltz, but also their ideas of how plenty of Europeans viewed the waltz in a sort of too over serious way, I think they would have seen eye to eye on that. Yeah. And you said that the song was 1918. Yes. So World War One had ended or was about to end? Uh, yeah, it was about to end. Yeah. Years. Right. So maybe Strauss's takedown of the walls also has something to do with mm -hmm. why did Germany have to do the, all of this sort of thing yeah. and Austria? Yeah, because it's I clear, mean, as I said, that I, I think a lot of Strauss's ideas you can really see after World War II that his frustration at Germany had a lot to do with because of their blind obsession with power and race. The collateral damage was all of this art and culture that he loved so much. Thanks very much. Good job. Thank you. Chris, it's a tremendous tapestry you've created for us. I mean, it's uh, you have left no stone unturned uh, in considering this piece. I uh, certainly expected that from you and I got it and it was wonderful, just wonderful. Um, this comes from my own background. My first and only piano teacher until I left uh, home and went away to school was a Latvian woman who went to Germany after World War I and came to a Latvian colony during World War II in North Carolina. <clears throat> and we've had several students uh, in, the, in the Juilliard School over the years from the studios of that Latvian colony in Belmont, North Carolina. Um, my teacher played for Pauline Strauss oh, wow. and played this piece for her. Wow. And just be 
in the case that it may be interesting to you for all of the reasons that you spoke about the waltz, the first time we experience the waltz in this song, there's the little ESP period written there. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is not written the second time, if I'm not mistaken. No, it's not. And so every time I ever played this piece for Mrs. Kegler's, she would say, exaggerate, exaggerate. Mm -hmm. And she taught me in my youth that this was a dismissal mm. of the beauty of the Viennese waltz, that it had to be an exaggeration. So in her experience, which I assume was with uh, the Mrs. Strauss, um, she had me exaggerate the the seventh, you know, reaching up in a, yeah. in a sort of grotesque way, a little uh, to make that um, Tuchter line a little yeah. less attractive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As you consider the milk and the butter and the eggs or whatever it is yeah. she's eaten so much of. At any rate, um, that just came to my mind as you were working because yeah. it's interesting to me that he did not write as Presivo the second time when all the forces, yeah, the conflicting forces of the song are at work. Mm -hmm. Well, amazing. Thank you. Thank you. That that further uh <laughs> solidifies like so many of the things she yeah. left me with. But um thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Margo. Great. Well, if that's um if that's everything, then thank you all so much for coming. And uh yeah. Have a great have a great day. And yeah, if anyone needs a transcript, wants a recording, um, I know Dr. Griffel, I'm I'll send the recording to the um Doctoral at Juilliard. Sure. Disseminated. Very good, Chris. That's quite Go an out. offer. Go Thank out you. and celebrate. And it's wonderful to see you, Margo. Thank you so much. Oh, it's just fabulous <laughs> to see you. I'm homesick now all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, I miss you. Anyway, bye bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>